Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. It's Kim here and welcome to our very first video on Techniques Tuesday. Uh, we're going to use that as a hashtag, hashtag Techniques Tuesday. And we're also going to use the hashtag Back to Basics um, because um, over the last few months I've uh, realized that I have a lot of newbies that are just learning and I've kind of thrown you right into the deep end with the hardcover journal book. Um, not even thinking about the fact that this is, this could be your very, very first journal. Um, uh, but you swam, uh, you all, you know, you all got above water and, um, uh, you're doing the dog paddle just fine. So, so, uh, in, in doing that and in realizing I had really taken you down a huge uh, rabbit hole of, of, uh, <laughs> stuff for this this hardcover journal I thought maybe we should go back to basics and start from the beginning um, so so that is how this uh, came about and uh, a lot of you have expressed that yes you want to do this and and here's what um, I'm, I'm where I'm going with this for, for those of you that are new to the the channel and new to the video Techniques Tuesday, we're going to start off today in this video making a book cover and uh, preparing the book cover for pages. And we're going to, to um, fill the pages with really junky papers because we don't care about the paper. At this point, it's not about the paper, it's about the techniques. And so we're going to fill it with really junky paper like flyers and, you know, maybe some used computer sheets and some leftover bits, whatever you have. Maybe you have some pretty paper you want to use up. Maybe you have some scrapbook paper. That's fine too. You can use your pretty papers. Um, and if you're a more seasoned journaler, maybe you want to use the nicer stuff. But right now I just want to get people with the idea of making a book and um, uh, putting it together. Once the book is put together, and that's going to take this part and next uh, week, uh, we're going to start filling the book page by page. And the book, and, and, and I can't, I don't even have anything to show you because I'm doing it right with you. Um, so the book will have uh, three signatures and I will, you know, explain signatures as well as we go along, which that's your uh, collection of papers that you, you put in your book. Um, three, to, three to four signatures, depending on the size of cover you make. And uh, we will fill it page by page with different types of ephemera. Now, as we fill it with ephemera, um, we will decorate a little bit at, at first and then get me into more serious decorating later on. But I'm going to also encourage you um, to, to use book pages um, and use scrappy papers to make your ephemera. And that is so you get used to uh, using and repurposing. And then when we make one for the book, I'm going to get you to start your ephemera box of unfinished ephemera, ephemera, and you're going to make 10 for the box. And the reason for that is um, then you start your collection of ephemera that you can use in your journals. Because once you start, whoop, knocking things over here. Once you start making journals, you know, you want to have that ephemera ready to go as much as possible. And I've talked about this in my other videos that I have one box of ephemera that is unfinished, which is where we're going to start with uh, while we're doing our techniques journal. And then I have a book, uh, a box that is uh, partially finished. I actually have two, but you would probably start with one. But if we even get you starting with the first box of the unfinished ephemera, uh, that's a really good start. And then I have a, uh, have uh, two more boxes that are finished ephemera. And that is because um, I tend to work in the same kind of colors, the same kind of style. So I just kind of uh, do things ahead of time and then um, I'll grab whatever I need to fill in in a journal. It's not that I won't do other things in the journal, uh, but but sometimes I, I'm lazy or, you know, it's already pre-done. So I just go get the stuff that's made. Um, but in doing this techniques uh, journal uh, journal that we're going to start on uh, in the series, um, not only will you have your your book of different ideas and things there for you, um, but you'll also have finished ephemera. And then, you know, you, it's not just my channel. You may be watching other channels and somebody will make something. So you'll go, oh, 
that's great for my book. So you, you can sit down and make that item, put it in your book and also make 10 more. So it's not just my channel. You can watch some of the other greats out there that are having, see, I've, I just put myself in the greats col column. How can I do that? <laughs> but you, there are other people out there that you can watch that are better than I am at, at making ephemera that will also teach you uh, tips and tricks. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing at myself. It's just a fun way to collect ephemera and have things to work with. And not only that, sometimes we, we forget when we're making a journal, uh, you know, we forget some of the oldie, but goodie techniques that we learned the real basic stuff like pockets and flips and, and snippets. And, and, uh, it's good to have a book sitting on your desk or several, cause we, you, there's a lot of different types of ephemera to make. Um, so it's good to have a book to go through where all of that stuff is there and you can label your books and call one book, um, you know, cause our first book is going to be pockets and uh, tabs and tucks. So it's really going to be all about, uh, putting stuff, um, where you would put something into the book and the, the, um, uh, as we go along in the series, we will also be filling the pockets. So you'll have your pocket or your, your, um, tuck or whatever that's on the page. And then we will also put things in it. So that will, uh, again, uh, refresh different ideas that you can use to put in your books. And, you know, I, I really do stress that, you know, you don't have to stop at just what I'm showing you by all means, uh, go to some of the other, oh, incredible, um, junk journalers who are seasoned and who've been making all kinds of things for years. Cause they're, they're going to show you a lot of techniques, a lot of things that I already do as well. Um, but we all have our own little spin off on it. So to get started, um, we talked about what you needed for, for, for the, uh, putting the book together and we're using a cereal box. Now, I don't eat a lot of cereal, so I don't have multiple cereal boxes. My husband doesn't eat cereal. Um, we don't have kids. We don't have grandkids. And w one of the the gals had made a comment on on um, one of my videos saying, well, why wouldn't you just use two cereal boxes, which I'll explain more in a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I'm really taking one for the team by buying, buying this and buying a large box of it because... Um, it will take me a while to eat it. I might have to find some recipes where I can use this up. Um, but, but yeah, so I'm not, uh, huge on, uh, big cereal boxes or on cereal. The only reason I'm using a large one like that is to give you a standard size box to cut up. And this, these are boxes that we all know, um, that, you know, we can go to the store, we can pick them off the shelf. You know, everybody's got them in one form or another. Uh, usually when I'm making a, uh, journal using, uh, this type of cardboard, I don't worry so much about the size of the box. I'll use, you know, uh, a cracker box or, um, uh, a cookie box that's a uh, different size or, you know, stovetop stuffing. We all know that one, right? Um, those are all awesome boxes to use for creating. The only thing is in that case, they're smaller than, um, eight and a half by 11 paper folded in half. So what happens there is you have to cut down your papers. And because we're starting as newbies and brand new, I wanted to have the right size box so we didn't have to worry about cutting down papers. And when it comes to cutting down papers, it also limits you as to what kinds of things you can put in the book. So again, I didn't want to be limited uh, and have you be limited to the to things I can show you because they won't fit in your in your book. So that's the only reason I'm working today with this large cereal box. And like I said, it is very far and few between that I get one. You know, uh, maybe if I made Rice Krispie Cake, but I have a horror story of Rice Krispie Cake that um, pretty much scarred me for life. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell it to you one day. But so that's the only reason I'm using this large of a box. Otherwise, I would build up if I wanted a larger box or I would uh, use a smaller one and cut my papers down. So having said that, uh, we're going to get started by opening up your box. Uh, make sure your cereal is gone from it, of course, and carefully open up the bottom as well. So I'm going to do this on camera. They, they open up pretty easily. There's the odd time where they're glued well. And then you need to look inside the box and along one of the two sides, not the front or the back, but along one of the two sides. And here's mine. I don't know if you can see it. 
is, there's my finger. There is where this box is joined. So you want to very carefully um, separate the join um, by hand. You can cut it open, but I like to save the cardboard as much as possible. And so just kind of pull your, your fingers and open up the box. And I'm stuck already. Okay. I just have to push a little bit harder. All right, here we go. It's coming, it's coming. And yes, you're going to watch me do this on camera and listen to me moan and groan while I do it. Because you'll be doing exactly the same thing and it won't look so easy if I if I do it off camera and then come back, right? So tug, push, pull until you get it open. Whew. Okay, a little bit of um, scruffiness there, but that's okay. And then there's that little piece that we cut off. So the first thing you're going to do all around the entire box is cut off all of these top and bottom flaps. And you're going to cut off this little strip. And you're going to cut off the one that it was joined to that now looks like this and has glue on it. But we will keep these because we're going to use some of this stuff later on. So do not get rid of all of this side stuff. Just all the top flaps, all the sides, and the bottoms. And I'll demonstrate with one little section. And then I'm going to stop the video and do mine. So all I'm doing is I'm cutting it. Now I'm cutting it on the inside of that little folded seam. So just uh, cut it with your scissors or your X-Acto blade, however you need to get it off. But we will keep these. I know, I keep everything. But yeah, we, we're going to keep these because this is part of your Techniques Tuesday. So I'm going to stop the camera and I will come back with mine all cut. Okay, now that we've cut away all the uh, flaps uh, from our box, you should be left with a piece that looks like this, that you can fold up into a book. But it's a really large book if you went with this jumbo uh, cereal box. It's a really large book. Now, we're going to cut down... Oh, and I kept all of these pieces. So I suggest you get a little tray or, or a basket of some kind that's big enough to hold all these things and keep them reasonably flat, like, you know, maybe a lid from a box. Um, because we're going to use all of this scrap stuff. Um, if you're just starting to watch my videos, I am a repurposer. I like to use everything. I hate seeing things go into the landfill. I like to give them one more life, if possible, before I send them to recycling. And yes, I recycle all of my paper. Nothing goes in the garbage. Everything is sorted uh, according to standards uh, in my area. And I do repurpose or recycle every little bit. Um, and, you know, we all need to do our part. So in, in using uh, recycled and repurposed materials, you are, yeah, eventually it may still end up in the landfill, um, but at least you're giving it one more life instead of going out and buying something brand new and just adding more to, to the, um, you know, the problem we have with recycling. So, so try to reuse wherever possible. Now, uh, once you have your book like this, we have to cut it down to size. And, and the sizes that we're going with is six inches wide, um, because your, your, um, your papers, your, your, uh, standard copy paper that, and any kind of papers that we're going to be using are going to be eight and a half by 11. I'm just grabbing one right now. Sorry. This is some tea dyed paper I have. So when you have an eight and a half by 11 copy paper or any kind of paper, you know, that comes in the mail and stuff, I just, uh, when you fold it in half, Um, it becomes five and a half inches by the eight and a half. So you want it to fit within um, the, the size of your book. Now, normally, normally when I'm cutting a book, um, I, would, I would make it nine by six, not nine and a half. Um, and that's because normally I stitch the signatures in. But this time we're going to be doing uh, what's called a Midori style of um, uh, holding the signatures. And that requires, now there are several different ways to do a Midori style. But I, I'm just going to get you to use, uh, uh, we're just going to put a hole for every signature, not yet, 
um, that we put in the book. Um, and, and so that we can tie it with an elastic or ribbon. Again, it's something that I can show you when, when we're putting in the book. But so that extra half an inch gives you enough room so that when we put the holes in, it's not going to interfere with our paper uh, and not going to cut into the paper if the elastic is too tight. So um, in doing this, you, you need an extra half an inch. If you're uh, not doing the Midori style with me, and you want to stitch your signatures in, uh, that is something you have to do on your own because I'm showing this method for a reason. Um, but if, if that's something you decide to do, then I would say, suggest making it nine inches, not nine and a half. And that is plenty of room to allow for your, your book to, to fit in nicely if you're using the eight and a half by 11 folded. Uh, but we're going to be doing the Midori style, and, and this is uh, where we use either elastic or ribbon or twine or thread, whatever you have, um, to tie your signatures in. And, and that is so that when we are working on these signature sections, you can add in extra pages if you want or take pages away. Um, you can change your design. Uh, or your layout, maybe you're, we're, we start out doing pockets and then you, you put in something else and then you decide, no, I want a separate section for that. You can move your pages around. Um, and what's fun is that when they get filled and, you know, maybe there's still room in your book because this is a large book. And if, if you're doing um, this jumbo cereal box with me, we're looking at at least four possibilities, maybe five possibilities for signatures in here. I, I would I would make the holes for four, but I would sort of uh, leave a little bit of space and then maybe we can put some uh, smaller books in between. So if we stagger these holes later on, don't worry about it now. I'm just explaining it um, and you don't have to draw them on the paper because we're nowhere near at that stage yet. Um, but, you know, once we've staggered these nicely, we can put smaller books um, that aren't eight and a half by 11 um, in between uh, to fill in any gaps. But I'm pretty sure we won't have any gaps. Um, but if we want to, we can add one or two in there as well. So these are this, this is why you need the extra half of an inch. If I was doing where I was stitching the the um, signatures in using the pamphlet style of uh, stitching, um, then I would only make it nine inches. Um, but that is for another day, another book uh, miles down the road. Which is why I, I really say I, we certainly put the, the cart before the horse in doing that hardcover book. And I apologize to you that our new, that, that uh, plunged your way through. Um, kudos to you. You deserve a gold star <laughs> for, for, for starting right from the, the, you know, the top end instead of at the bottom. But you've already done some hidden spine, uh, which again is something that uh, we will learn in Techniques Tuesday as we go along. So once you've, you've um, uh, got your, your, your cardboard out and we know that it's got to be uh, nine and a half by six. Uh, so I'm going to take a ruler and I'm going to do this side with you so that you know how I figured this out. I took my ruler and I, I lined it up with the nine and a half and, and hope that it's reasonably straight, that I'm not on an angle. There's a little bit of eye. Uh, you may even want to start along the edge if that will help you um, to, to line it up better so that you know you're pretty squared. So I've, and, and if you have a square ruler, you know, one of the ones that has the arm that goes both ways, you could also use that to line up. Um, but I'm just using a ruler and winging it. Um, so it's at nine and a half at the bottom, bottom corner here. And I'm just going to make a line across like that and then move it over ever so slightly. And like I said, I hope that I'm lining up reasonably close. And again, ever so slowly in small sections. But it's it's surprising, you know. You think you're you're not very far from six inches, uh, but it's surprising how quickly you you get to the six inch point. Um, so I'm going to again line it up one more time here, and then I'm going to take my ruler at the six inch and I'm going to line it up just on the uh, left side of my spine fold. Okay, so just right on the side of it. 
and I'm going to do the same thing, measure it, and down again. And one more back up here. And then I'm going to draw my line. So now um, you want to make sure your ruler is lined up just before. Maybe I'll do it from this side so you can see. So you want to line it up just at that line as if you were going to continue drawing. So you want to make sure that your pen um, does sit right where the line is or pencil, whatever you're using uh, to mark and go right through. So now I've kind of lost here. And no, I didn't do this on purpose. It should have been perfect the first time, but it, it wasn't. So I'm going to just kind of line it up again. The ruler moved, but that's okay. It moved in the right direction. Okay, so there's my line that way. And, you know, it's also easier to stand up and do it. I don't know if I can stand in here while I'm doing this, but I won't be able to see what I'm doing. But hopefully you will. And there it is. So now this is also nine and a half inches by six inches. So the next thing is to cut it out. Now I have a guillotine cutter and I'm going to use my guillotine cutter to cut it, but you can certainly cut it by hand, cut it with scissors, cut it with a blade. Um, everybody's cutter method is different. This is also uh, 12, at least 13 inches. So some of you only have the standard scrapbook cutter to cut your, your, um, your uh, cardboard. And some of you, the, the cutters won't work. Um, because you've got those fine blades and it'll just eventually shred it or chew it. Um, if you're in this for the long haul, I do recommend a guillotine cutter. Now the one I have here is fabulous, but it's not as good as, as some that I've had in the past. I left a really nice wooden one behind that I absolutely loved when I moved only because I had to make a decision. Um, so this one was the most versatile because it goes up to 14 inches and it goes, I think to 17 inches long, I think, or maybe it's 15 inches long. Yeah, it's 15 inches long. Uh, so it's not your standard size of cutter. And if you are going to invest in a cutter like this, you want one with the guillotine blade, a really strong, hard blade, not the little back and forth things. And to buy a brand new one like this, you're looking at around $250 because I've priced them and they are nowhere near as good. These new ones are nowhere near as good. Uh, you can get those uh, scrapbooking ones that have this type of blade, but there again, they're made out of uh, materials that are not strong. The blade is not like this blade in itself. Uh, just the, the blade weighs a ton. Um, so, so you, you would be investing money into something that is not going to do this type of cutting. I can cut mat board on this. Um, and, and certainly any type of chipboard on here, but if I was to recommend any type of a cutter, I would recommend the old fashioned wooden school guillotine cutters. You know, the ones we all had in school, um, back in the day, and you can find those in antique shops and yes, you're going to pay, you know, maybe you'll get lucky and get one for $50, but you know, don't be surprised if they aren't a hundred dollars. Um, but if you're going to get one of those, you want to make sure it's one that has the grid lines in it and the deeper grid lines are great for scoring too, uh, which is nice. And you want to make sure it has a good set of numbers, take a ruler with you and make sure it lines up because some of them are finicky and weird and they don't always line up. So, you know, you have to take your ruler with you and find out the truth, uh, uh about both your ruler and your, your, uh, cutter. Um, again, so, so if you buy a wooden school, you know, the old office type guillotine cutters, it's going to cost you about a hundred dollars and then it's the blade. 
Um, then you would need to take the blade off. Well, I mean, you can test it to see, but you need to take the blade off and uh, take it to someone who sharpens knives or skates or any of that kind of stuff and have them sharpen it. I promise you, you will, you will use that cutter for the rest of your life and, and maybe even for your kids' lives because once it's nice and sharp, it, it is amazing. And I mean, they used them in schools for years and years and years, uh, every day, you know, hundreds of cuts every day, way more than you will ever cut. And, and so that's why I say test the blade first to make sure it might, it might still be sharp. But the, that is an investment that you will make that not only is um, a good quality cutter, but it's also kind of a statement piece in your in your craft room. So I am on the lookout for another one. I just haven't had time to visit the antique shops. And a lot of times I forget when I'm there. So this is a reminder for me as well. But if you're if you're going to look for a cutter, that is what I highly recommend uh, to, to get as a cutter. The old fashioned school wooden cutters with this great big blade with that um, hand that you, handle that you grip onto to use. And then in speaking about cutters, the other thing that you do have to really pay attention to when you're cutting is if people have a tendency to take a cutter like this, and it's hard, I don't have enough room on my desk or in the camera to show you the whole visual, but people have a tendency, to, and I'm just going to put this down so it's out of the way, to take a cutter and go this way to cut. And that will shred your paper. It will also um, cut off uh, away from your paper. So it's cutting further. So your measurements are going to be out and your paper is going to be shredded. And people also think that they can pile up 50 sheets because they've got this amazing cutter, but these sheets are all shifting and moving while you're cutting. So, so then your, your paper doesn't end up cutting straight. I will maybe cut two sheets at a time at any given time unless I really don't care how straight it is. If I'm just cutting paper up to maybe put through, um, um, my Sizzix machine or something. And I'm, so I'm just cutting it into squares. Then I don't really, I'm not really concerned. And then I'll pile it up and cut more at a time. But if I want really nice precision cutting, then I won't cut more than maybe two sheets at a time. And I measure and, and see that, you know, if I'm looking for an exact cut, then I'm, I do want to make sure that I'm getting a nice cut. But the biggest, biggest mistake people make is they take the cutter and they move it to the right uh, in order to cut. But what you should be doing is bringing it towards you because that's bringing it towards this metal bar here that is the other side of your cutter. It's not sharp, but it brings the cutter to, to this blade, which is the exact measurement. And if you look at my blade right now, I can, I can stick a, a ruler in here because it's, it's, it's not touching this metal, but when it's open, that's the part that's touching the metal. So as you go down and you move forward, uh, I don't know if you can see that or not, but it is cutting right along the paper. So to, when you push it away, you're actually training the, bl the blade to go that way. So you always want to bring the cutter towards you. And another rule of thumb <laughs> is always make sure you do not have long sleeves in your way and uh, sweaters that have those floppy pieces hanging out. Because one day I uh, was using my cutter and three times in a row I was cutting and I was, you know, I was really pushing the cutter down because it's like, well, why is it so stuck? Why is it not going through this? board so nicely and I you know I was really hammering down on it and then I picked it up and I moved the paper to do the next uh, or the whatever chipboard I was cutting to do the next piece and again I you know I would get to this point and it wasn't cutting and I'd hammer it down and by the time I was finished I had totally shredded my sweater so so that is one of the rules is to to make sure that you're you're wearing the right clothing and or old clothing so that you don't care but um so that's my little spiel on cutters and what to look for and how to use them now you can certainly cut this by hand using an exacto blade or or um any type of um cutting tool that you have but I love my guillotine cutter, so I'm going to use that. Now I'm hoping I line this up pretty straight. Yeah, I think I'll have to go from this way. Um, because I may not have cut the base perfectly straight when I was cutting with scissors. Okay. 
And yes, you have to listen to the whole thing as I go through this. Okay, I'm going to be forced to do it this way, one way or another. And I'm keeping all of these off cuts as well. And this is not going to fit all the way in, so I'm going to do it from two different sides and hope that I line it up in the middle nicely. And hope that my, my uh, board is relatively straight. So it's not the end of the world if it's not, and I don't have a lot of room here to work, so I'll just try to... Okay, and I came away just a little shy, and so I'm just going to trim that with my scissors and fix it up because when you're cutting from one end to the other, you can't all you don't always see that it, you're lining up perfectly. And I'm sitting down to do this, so. And there I have it. There is my basic book cover ready to go. And I'm going to still have this cutter on the table because I'm going to show you the next part. The next part is we need to build on this cover. Even though it feels very strong, it's, it's not that strong. And so we want to add a little bit more to it because when it's sitting on your shelf um, and it's going to get used and abused over and over again, you're going to be adding things to it, uh, building on it, um, using it for reference. So you want to make sure your book is sturdy. And this is where uh, one of the subbies had said to me, um, when you, because when I build on this, I use whatever I have. I use cardstock, other chipboard that I have. Maybe I have other boxes like this that aren't as big that I can use in uh, as for building. Um, I use file folders. It really, car uh, corrugated cardboard, it really doesn't matter what you use to build it up. My biggest problem is, like I said, I don't eat a lot of, um, or I don't eat cereal. And so, so I don't have a lot of large cardboard pieces that I can use to reinforce this. So I use whatever I have. So in this case today, I'm going to use file folders because I just had them handy. And I'm going to cut uh, two pieces that are six inches by nine and a half, but just slightly under, because I don't want them to go right to the edge. So, first I'm going to open it up so that I have two pieces to work with. And no room. And again, this is not something I need precise at cutting. So I'm not worried that I have two pieces uh, over top of each other. So uh, if I'm making this six inches wide, I'm just going to make it slightly smaller, maybe, um, you know, five and seven eighths. Does that sound right? Yeah. Just a smidgen smaller. And you can certainly cut these by hand. And then I'm going to the nine and a half and cutting them that way. And just again, slightly smaller, just a smidgen. And that is so I can fit them in my book. Like this, you can see it's just slightly smaller so that it's not going to hang over. Um, and, and I'm going to be gluing these down. So now I need a piece for the middle. And the reason I didn't measure that is because I don't know what size box you have. So you're gonna go nine and a half, but just slightly uh, short of it. And then you're going to do um, uh, whatever the width is. And in my case, and please make sure you measure every brand is different than the other. Uh, and this is three and a, about a quart. Yeah, th yeah, about three and a. Uh, it's like three and a, and an eighth. So I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna measure at three and an eighth and see if I can. Now was my file folder big enough? No. So I have some brown cardstock here. 
and I'm going the long way because it is um, nine and a half inches. So I'm going the long way. Now it's three and an eighth. I just did just slightly under my three and an eighth mark. We'll see how good I do. By nine and a half. And I didn't trim that back at nine and a half. So when I put it in here, it's going to be, oh, that's pretty good. So my cardboard was probably just a little bit bigger than that. And it's, it's a little loose in the center, but that's okay. So now once you've got those pieces cut out to glue down on the inside, you're going to turn around and do the same thing on the outside. So I'm going to stop the camera because I don't want to waste the time. And I'm going to do my outside pieces too. Okay, so now I have my, my um, spine and side pieces for both sides, and we're going to get back to gluing that on right away. And I have all the leftover file folder pieces, and I have that uh, brown piece that was left over from cutting out my, my um, uh, spines because I didn't have enough file folder here. And this was just a way to show you, again, it really doesn't matter what you use as long as you have something to build up your, your pages, and it doesn't matter what color we're going to be covering it anyway. And all of these scraps, we are going to keep them all. Even if, if you used a file folder like I did and you took the fold off first, even these pieces are going to get used. So we're just going to stick them in that little spare box of parts uh, that we're building on um, because we will be uh, referring back to these. I'm going to keep my parts with my book too. And, and um, this way, you know, if you ask me about something later on, I can, I can show you some of those techniques and tips as well as we go along. Um, but yeah, this, this is a great way to use up, you know, leftover bits and pieces. You know, if you don't have a file folder, phone a friend. Somebody has somebody who works in an office. You can pick up file folders at, you know, the thrift shop. You can even buy them at your, your local dollar store in small packs. Uh, they're not expensive. Um, so yeah, I would start with, you know, checking your own, your own uh, supply or else uh, phoning a friend because everybody's got file folders. In fact, if you said uh, on Facebook to 10 of your friends, Who's got some file folders I can have? I'm, I'm sure you'll get more than you'll ever need in your lifetime. So, so do keep this stuff and uh, we will get back to it uh, later on in the series as we go along. And right now we're just going to deal with putting these uh, pieces onto your, your, um, your base. There's another one there. Okay, so I'm just using a plain tacky glue. I just put it in this, it's a um, icing sugar bottle, I think is what they call it. Hopefully it'll work for me today. Yay, it's starting. Okay, maybe. Just because I'm on camera, right? And it is a full bottle. It's just got a little bit of air in there. So I'm just running it. around the edges and sort of back and forth swirling around this has got to be like watching paint dry and then I just spread it out with my spreader tool and this is if you haven't heard me talk about it before this you can pick up at the makeup departments in any of your local dollar stores or five and dime type stores and I'm just going to put this piece down making sure it's within all of the edges of the book and using a credit card or um, your bone folder or any tool that you have that will spread out your glue and spread out your you know, move it around under the paper or the file folder is all you need and so I'm going to do one more with you and then I'm going to do the rest off camera yeah it's working good now much better. 
you know, there's always this thing where, um, you know, you're going to have just the slightest issues <laughs> when you're on camera that you never have when you're off camera. And spreading my glue. And you don't have to be too careful at this point either because it's uh, all of this is going to be covered. So if you get glue on the file folder like that, don't worry about it. Just don't stick your finger in it. Otherwise it'll be all over. And I'm just resting my, this is the cardstock piece that I cut again, showing you that you don't have to use, you use what you have. Don't go out and buy anything. Um, if you don't have cardstock or file folder, what about a duotang or an old um, exercise book that has a cover, you know, the, um, the line scribblers? Um, that cover is, is equally good to use. Okay, I said I was going to go off camera. You don't want to watch me spreading glue. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go off camera and I'm going to come back and show you the finished piece. And I'm doing the other side as well. Okay, I'll be back shortly. And here I am with my cover. So I've glued my um, three pieces down on the outside as well on as on the inside. And if you're doing this along with me, I know you can you can feel the cover already is getting nicely. It, it feels a lot more sturdy than when it what it originally felt. And this always gets me excited. It's a brand new book to work on. Um, so, you know, I didn't go right to the edges of the spine uh, because that is where there's a lot of pressure of it opening and closing. And we're going to be covering the spine differently. Um, and we're, we're going to be covering the inside differently as we go along. And we don't want to have too much buildup in here that it starts to um, bulk out into your book. And then it, you know, it looks wrinkled and uh gapey kind of thing. So, so yeah, you want to stay within those folds. It doesn't have to be a perfect fit. It's just to give it some added strength. And I know, um, <laughs> some of my gal pals are going to make fun of me, Val, <laughs> um, because I have this thing and, and I say, your book should be so strong that you can throw it around just like when you make boxes, right Val? Um, they bug me so much, <laughs> but they're my friends and I love them. Um, I, you know, I make reference to that. You should be able to throw this book uh, across the room and it's not going to fall apart. And then, you know, it passes the Kim test and that it is uh, sticking. I see I have one little corner here that was sticking up. I'm just uh, pressing it down now. But yeah, so that is the most important thing is to, to, uh, really glue your pieces well and make sure that you're in the lines here and then you will have nice sturdy covers. So from here, we're going to go on and decorate this with book pages and book pages. Again, it's a great way to use up the extra pieces that you have. I don't understand when people say they, they don't use half their book pages. They, they recycle them. I use everything. I use every scrap up all the time. And, um, I'm always, uh, starting a new book every time I turn around. So we're going to cover it on both sides with book pages. And I had mentioned in the follow-up video to work with an assortment of papers. I'm just going to get my basket here. Um, so I have an assortment of old, um, this is old rag paper, um, but it's just, it doesn't have to be old papers. I just have different sizes, different colors. I have dictionary pages, encyclopedia this is just a small little book in German, but it wasn't in the greatest shape. So I'm just tearing it apart to use the pages. You know, I have, I have a lot of uh, German textbooks only because I, I love the script in there. Um, so, you know, I don't know what they say. It's, most of them are of religious content, but I use them anyway. And, you know, I have different kinds all the time. Dictionaries, encyclopedias, music sheets. Um, right now, I don't think I have any music sheets left. Oh, I do. I have a couple bigger ones here. I have some uh, Ukrainian text. I believe it's Ukrainian and uh, maybe Russian. And then I have, here's some music sheets. So it's whatever, whatever I have in my stash. Um, I just like the assortment of colors, the different text. I go back and forth. 
um, upside down and backwards. It really doesn't matter to me. And um, if you followed yesterday when I was doing the envelope, it's going to be pretty much the same procedure. So that's the first thing you need for, for uh, book pages, is book pages. And then you need a glue pad to work on. And then you need a ruler or some type of tool to quickly tear your papers and your glue stick, just your plain, whatever glue stick you use, whatever is comfortable for you. And that's how we're going to get started. So I'm just going to show you how to do the papers and then I'm going to uh, stop the video and I'm going to make a part two today only because this is a lot of stuff to do all in one video and it would be extremely long. So I'm going to make a part two. So to show you how to tear the pages, I just take the page at, you know, maybe about a third of the way and I tear it and then tear the next one. You may have a fancy tear ruler that you'd like to use. Uh, you may use this, you know, the side of a, your desk. I've torn papers like that. You can also tear them by hand. The only thing I find with tearing by hand is sometimes the paper does this, you know, and, and so you don't have that nice um, squared off cut. And, and these are great too, depending on where you want to use them. But I find it just takes a little longer to cut them straight and you get these little chunks taken out. So it's easier to cut with some type of a tearing tool and, um, and then do different types of papers. And here I will do two or three at a time. And this is the same method I use for covering envelopes, for covering uh, master boards, all kinds of stuff. So just get some papers ready uh, while you're waiting for me to do part two. And um, uh, I have some music sheet already cut up here. And if you have papers that have this little nubby edge from tearing it out of your book, I... I take that out of there because a lot of times it's got glue on it or, or um, folded pieces that, you know, just make it awkward to unfold. So then again, I just cut them up into thirds. I like to have different colors and textures, different sizes. You can use big pieces, little pieces, whatever works for you and what whatever makes you um, makes it easier for you. Okay, so I'm going to stop the camera and I'm going to come back ready to go. Uh, like I said, you need a glue pad, which is like a scrapbook or, or an old scrapbook magazine or a catalog or, you know, maybe you have an old Sears catalog. Not too old, though, because those ones we can use. Um, you may have some, uh, you know... Um, person you know the magazines that have like beauty magazines um, and some of those things are great for cutting up uh, pictures and uh, words out of them and so you want to check each page as you go along I find I use a lot of these um, um, online catalogs and and uh, they work great and usually you can get them from from different companies if you uh, contact them they'll send you one <laughs> for the wrong purpose, I suppose. Uh, but you also get a lot of glossy flyers in the mail or, you know, phone a friend. Maybe they've got an, a, a whole stash of National Geographic magazines that you can use up, whatever, whatever you can find. Um, and my local thrift shop uh, gives away magazines for free. And there are other thrift shops that give away magazines for free too, or very inexpensive. Sometimes they sell 10 for a dollar. So, so either way, find yourself a glossy book that you can use to glue in. And I will explain more about this in in the next video so i will take you uh to the end of this for now and then um just look for part two which will follow right after this and uh we'll get our book covered today okay see you in a few minutes